Chapter 16 Durin sighed and stretched his rather stiff back out, arching it until he heard and felt the vertebrae pop with a rather satisfying series of cracks. That was probably the only amount of pleasure he was going to be getting this morning, seeing as a cold rain had set in over the caravan in the middle of last night, which had prompted a scramble from the wagoneers to pull out oiled canvases to cover the boxes in an attempt to ward off the rain from soaking into whatever it was that they were shipping. They had also blocked up the wheels of the wagon in an attempt to make sure they didn't sink into the mud and become impossible to move in the morning. Little good that had done. The well-packed dirt road had turned to soup, Soup of the worst possible variety, as this mud had practically turned into slime. As such, the horses had a particularly hard time of it, pulling the wagons along. They had mud caked well past their fellocks, and some of the splashings had even started to coat the poor creature's beds with a layer of it. The horses were not the only ones either. Every time the wagon stalled or started to slide due to the slick mud, Duran, Lysica and Michaeline would get down like everyone else and get behind the wagon to push or lift or whatever needed to be done. As such, the three of them were coated in mud, in Durin's case all the way up to his knees and all over his forearms, though he made sure to use a section of the cape on his order uniform to wipe his palms clean. It would be hard enough to grip a sword hilt with wet hands should he need it, never mind hands covered in mud. To add to the sombre and disheartened mood of it all, Lysica was not best pleased with him, it would seem. She had not spoken to him despite his attempts to make conversation this morning, not since she had woken up and seen what sort of day it was going to be. Durin didn't know if he more agreed with the woman, or if he was more annoyed by her stubborn refusal to converse. On the one hand, it was his fault that they were out here today. After all, he had selected the contract. On the other hand, however, he had no way of knowing this was the sort of weather they would be travelling through. He was, after all, not Luni, the goddess of storms now, was he? The worst part of it all was how well it had been up until this point. This was their third day out of Kadala, and so far they had been making great progress. Sure, there had been nothing to liven up the trips, no attacks, not even a monster sighting, but they had all been in relatively good moods, telling jokes, funny anecdotes about their childhoods, and doing some light sparring to pass the time when the caravan had stopped for one reason or another. Durin had even gone to give Lysica a kiss goodnight last night before she had gone into the tent she was sharing with Michaeline. All in all, it was a fantastic two days in Durin's opinion, tempered by the fact that he was going to be able to see more of the world. And then this goddess damned rain has shown up and screwed it all over. He shook his head in disgust as the wagon they were on once again got stuck in a thick patch of mud. With a sigh he held on to the sideboard of the wagon and dropped down into the muck, making sure to hold on to it in order to not lose his footing. He looked up to see Lysica standing there waiting to get down after him, and he held out his hand in order to help her down. She looked at it for a moment, then relented, allowing him to help her step down off the wagon and into the mud. She might be upset with him at the moment, but she was still his betrothed. They made their way around the back of the wagon to where three of the wagoneers in their rain-slick leather cloaks. Let's wait for Wilfred, one of them said, and Durin cocked his head to the side in lieu of asking a question. Off relieving himself in the bushes, the man said. No point in straying harder than we need, he'll be back any second. Nodding, Durin looked over at Lysica. His mouth opened as he was about to attempt to see if she would engage him in conversation this time, or if he was doomed to receive the cold shoulder for as long as this rain held up. Before he could, there was a scream, and Durin turned away from her, his hand quickly going to his sword hilt and gripping tightly. He stepped forward, pushing two of the wagoneers out of the way and stepping forward. He was pleased to see that though Liska was upset with him, she still stepped forward like he had, putting herself between the wagoneers and the scream, with Michaeline quickly making his way up to Durin's left side as he came from the rear wagon. They formed a triangle of sorts with Durin in the lead, Liska on his right and slightly behind, and Michaeline in the left and back a few paces. Durin took a few more steps forward, the bushes blocking his sight, and when they started to shake and move like something was coming through them, he drew his blade. Lysico and Michaeline doing the same, all three dropping into a fighting posture, lowering their centre of gravity in an attempt to gain more stability and purchase on the slick ground. Terrain like this was the worst sort of ground one could ask for if there was to be a fight. Even the likes of the old man would have found it daunting. No matter how nice your saw work or your footwork, or would be for not if you slipped at just the wrong moment. Durin tensed as a shade came out of the bushes, and they remained tense even as he found himself looking at one of the wagoneers, more caked in mud than usual and looking rather harried as he scrambled through the bushes and back to the relative safety of the wagon. Durin and the others let him pass, none of them stopping him, as doing so would have required them to take their eyes off of the bushes he had just come through, and whatever was on the other side, that might have caused him to flee. 
Durin stood there for a heartbeat, his breathing slow, raindroppers hitting the flight of his blade, and then sliding down the oil of metal, and forming a rivulet that ran down the fuller till they hit the curved crossguard, almost like a small river or stream encountering a dam. He considered his options. On the one hand, nothing had come through those bushes after Wilfred, but on the other, there was no guarantee whatever it was, he wasn't waiting for them to drop their guard and then attack as they moved to hell the wagon and get unstuck. He glanced first right, then left, getting from each of them a small nod that told him they were thinking the same thing. Decided, he strode forward towards the bush, intent on using the path the wagoneer had crashed through the undergrowth to get through. After a short struggle, he found himself on the other side in a fairly large clearing, and there, at the far end, stalked a creature that was hard to make out in the rain. From what he could see, it was a beast of some form, walking on all fours, though his front legs looked oddly large and bulky. It also looked to roughly be the size of a large deer, not quite as big as the horses hitched the wagons, but still a good size, especially if it was a predator of some sort, which judging by the stalking way it was moving, Durham was willing to bet every tick in his bag that he had left tucked under the wagon seat, it was. He waited to move forward to get a better look until both Lissica and Michaeline had cleared the bushes, and they were back in their triangular formation. Once in position, he stalked forward. The thing's shape shifted slightly, his eyes now able to make out what looked like an elongated neck a triangular head, and a tail almost the length of its body. Growing ever more certain as to what the creature was, he took a few more steps forward and was able to confirm it. Standing in front of him was a wyron. It was a young one. Durin could tell, both based on the size as well as on its coloration, full adult wyrons were massive, nearly twice the size of a good draft horse, and they always had bright, colourful scales. Either red, or blue, or rarely orange or purple, Younglings, however, were obviously smaller and often sported green and brown scales in a sort of camouflage in order to protect them from other predators. Wyverns were often confused as dragons or drakes, both of which were also reptilian, though dragons were much, much larger and had four limbs plus the wings, whereas drakes were wingless entirely and also tended to be larger than the average wyvern. There was also the fact that wyverns and drakes did not breathe fire, Rather, wyverns had a rather nasty barbed tail that secreted a rather potent poison that should it get into a person's bloodstream would mark a very painful end to the victim, as it caused liquefaction of all internal organs, which needless to say was not a very pleasant way to go. Durin looked at the creature's front legs, or rather, he should say wings. Unlike a dragon or drake, the wyvern had no front limbs proper. Rather, it folded its wings and used the clawed pseudo-limbs to walk, the wings tucked up close to its body. That meant that it was slower on land, less manoeuvrable, though still quite fast and deadly. What's more, this one was a youngling, which meant it hadn't started to fly proper. Sure, it could propel itself into the sky using its large cord and muscular back legs, and then glide on its wings for a few metres, but it couldn't really fly. The wyvern looked at him with baleful red eyes that sparked with malice and intelligence, and Durin locked gazes with it, taking a step forward. What are you doing? Liska hissed, and he risked a glance back at her only to find her slowly backing up, never taking her eyes off the wyvern. Surprised, Durin looked over his other shoulder and saw that Michaeline was also doing the same. Sure, wyverns were hard to fight, especially the large ones. Hell, even the small ones were a pain in the ass, seen as their scales were harder than metal, and no matter what you did, there was no way to cut through them. But they weren't that hard. He looked back at the wyvern. His eyes locked on him as he swayed his head back and forth in a rather snake-like motion. Don't be a fool, Liska hissed, but he ignored her. He was cold, and rather would like something to let a little of his frustration out on, and damned if he didn't think this youngling would do just fine for those purposes. There was also the fact that the tail of a youngling made for an excellent meal when you removed the poison vein that ran to the tip of the tail and sautéed it in some oil. It became the most succulent meat ever, with a spiciness to it that seemed to linger in the stomach hours after you had finished eating, making it perfect for cold winter days, or rainy days like this. And the scales and bones also sold well, he and the old man had proven that time and time again, bringing several carcasses every time they had gone to market, and always leaving with a sack of coins. Durin! Liska yelled, and Durin broke out of his reverie, and saw that the wyvern had decided to lunge at him. Thankfully, the ground here was covered in grass and other undergrowth, meaning there was a good amount of traction for his boots, so he was easily able to size up the lunge of the creature's head. With a smile, he brought the pommel of his blade down, smashing it into the glowing red orb as it went past. The weighted fuss at his service slamming into the soft eye with a rather satisfying squish. The wyvern hissed in pain and lashed out with one wing. The joint tipped with claws the size of daggers, but Durin had already danced out of the way. He took several steps back and looked at the beast, one of his eyes closed and oozing a mixture of clear fluid as well as blood down the side of his face. 
He smiled and reached forward, gripping his blade in one hand before bringing his other up to hold onto it as well. There was no way in hell a sword would be able to cut through those scales, so instead he started half-sorting. The weight of the pommel on the end of his hilt was substantial. It had to be to balance the length and weight of the rest of the sword, and as such made for quite the effective mace in a pinch. The wyvern turned his head sideways, observing him with his one good eye. The black snake tongue flicking out to taste of the air as his head swayed side to side, gauging distance again. This time, when it lunged, he stepped to his left, dodging towards his working eye and swung his sword with all his might in a horizontal blow. The pommel came in contact with the secretion of his head right behind his eye socket, striking where the creature's internal ear would be, several of the scales covering the head in that area cracking under the force of the blow. The impact caused the blade to vibrate so violently that it shook Durin's arms, and he had to struggle to retain his hold on the blade, though the effects on the wyvern were much, much worse. The creature let out a distressed and wounded sound as it fell sideways, its feet scrambling as it attempted to remain upright. Through the disorientation and pain, though his efforts were ultimately in vain. It fell to the ground and Durin followed his strike with an over-the-head downward blow that put all his strength and body weight into the strike, the pommel smashing into the wyvern's snout, snapping the gaping maw shut with what had to be a bone-rattling or at least tooth-loosening click, as several more of the scales in his nose cracked under the assault. Durin took several steps back. He could have easily pressed the attack, striking at its head or neck and kept it disoriented, or perhaps even gone for its other eye, but that was not how he fought a wyvern. Up to this point he had hurt it, but had not done anything to really kill it. He couldn't like that with the weapon he had. The scales were too tough for that. They provided excellent protection for the youngling. There was only one real weak spot on these damn things. It stood back up, its eye narrowed and more cautious. It took a step forward, and it danced to the side, tail lashing out. On a full-grown wyvern... This would have been one of his main attacks, but on the youngling, the poison was much less potent, meaning it tended to rely on the strength of his bites. Durin parried the tail, driving it down and planting it into the soggy ground, before bringing his foot up and stomping on the tip of it with all his might. The spine of hollowed bones snapped, and the wyvern hissed in outrage as it withdrew its now useless tail. It took several steps back, and Durin let it, allowing himself to also take a few away from it. If it was doing what he was hoping it was doing, then it would need a decent amount of distance between itself and him. He felt his smile grow as he watched its back legs tense, and it lunged into the air, springing straight up and into the sky a good four or five metres. Durin! He heard Lysica scream, but he ignored it. He had to focus. The wyvern dived down, its more open, as it fell towards him, and he let go of the blade with one hand, grabbing instead the crossguard and flipping it around so that it was point first. Kneeling down, he placed the pole into the ground and angled the tip up, one hand holding the crossguard while the other held the blade at about the halfway point. He heard a scream as Wyvern finished his dive, intent on getting his jaw around Durin's head and upper torso, completely failing to see the tip of the sword planted against the ground. Its weight caused the point of the blade to sink into the roof of its mouth with little to no resistance. The blade slid in as the monster bore down and speared out of the back of its head, a fine pink mist and its lost scales flying as it came through. Blood ran down the blade in dark rivulets and over Durin's hands. It shuddered, once, twice, and then moved no more, as the fire in his eye was replaced by confusion before it turned glassy and lifeless. Durin shifted his weight, allowing the creature to roll onto its side using the blade as a pivot point, before standing and stretching out his tense muscles. Well then, he said, turning to look at Liska and Michaeline. Both were still standing there, almost immobile, but for some reason, Liska was shaking, her hands clenched in tight fists at her sides. He watched warily as she walked forward until she stood in front of him. The cowl of her ordered clothing covered her face so that he couldn't see. Lysica, I... The slap came out of nowhere. It would have landed had his reflexes not been so honed. He found his hand around her wrist, holding it away from her face, and he could feel the straining of her muscles against his own. After a second, she stopped struggling, and he felt her arm go limp. At this distance, he was able to make out that her shaking was not anger or fear, but rather that she was crying. She pulled her hand from his and turned, walking briskly away back towards the wagons. What in the goddess's name? Michaeline looked at him, one eyebrow raised. What was that for? he asked. You really don't know? Michaeline asked. And Durin shook his head, watching as she made her way back through the bushes. She was scared, Durin. It was just a young wyvern. No, she wasn't scared of the wyvern. I mean, she was, but that's not why she is mad right now. Michaeline looked at him with a sceptical look. Do I need to spell this one out for you? He asked, and Durin nodded. Please do. 
She was mad because she was scared. Not of the wyvern, but that you would be hurt or worse killed. And if I had to guess, that why you revealed to her that she actually is starting to like you. I wouldn't go so far as to say she was starting to love you. You've only known each other for a few days. But she never expected to actually like her betrothed. She fully expected to hate everything about her future husband. Which makes liking you a new emotion for her. She's never been in a relationship, and so she is reacting to all this fear with anger, as it is an emotion she knows well. But, but, Durin was at a loss of words. It was just a small wyvern. Michaeline sighed, pinching the bridge of his nose. Yeah, he said in a tired voice. I didn't really expect you to understand. After all, it's just a wyvern. It's not like a group of five are needed to hunt them with maces or anything. He said the last part in a clearly mocking voice, but before Durin could say anything, he sighed again and motioned at the carcass. So, what do you want to do with this thing? Help me drag it back? Durin asked. Fine. Michaeline nodded, and Durin bent over, grabbing his blade, and with a boot on the Vivan's snout, he was able to pull it free of the creature. Michaeline picked up one of the forewings of the creature with a grunt of effort, before letting it drop to the ground with a heavy slap of flesh against soggy ground, as Durin cleaned his blade. Yeah, he sighed. It's only a small wyvern. Once again, using his sarcastic voice. Thank you very much for listening, everyone. This is the last chapter of The Blade's Own Truth I will be narrating on the channel. If you want to check out the rest of the book, it is available in the link in the description below, and you can support the authors with a honest review. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy this, because I certainly did enjoy reading it. If you wish to support me and what I do, please consider subscribing and hitting the bell icon if you haven't done so already. And I also have links in the description of this video for Discord, Patreon and Twitch if you want to follow me on those. Thank you very much.